can't be shown on television. The unique process begins when the titanium layers are bonded together in a secret pattern. Then the whole blade is inflated like a balloon, pulling and stretching the inner layer across the cavity, like cheese between slices of pizza, leaving a super light, super strong internal structure. But before it can be inflated, the flat titanium sandwich has to be heated and twisted into shape. Then it's ready for the most critical stage of the process, inflation. We've used an inert gas. It's, we can't have it reacting with the titanium at temperature. It's a high pressure inside to inflate it to the level of accuracy we need. A heat resistant tube connects the blade to a high pressure gas supply. But the gas alone won't be enough to inflate the blade. The whole assembly also has to be loaded into a furnace at a secret, critical temperature. A single speck of dust could cause a lot of damage. And John doesn't get much time to prepare. It gets very hot. After about 30 seconds, you've got to come away. You can't stand there too long at all. If you do, you just start burning all your gloves, fingers, everything. It takes four and a half hours for the gas to slowly inflate the blade to its precise aerofoil shape. Despite the precision of the engineering, no two finished blades are exactly alike. And with 20 in each fan, it will only spin smoothly if the blades are perfectly balanced. So every one is precisely measured and weighed, then rung like a bell. Each blade has a different mass and different frequency, and we use that data to select where those blades are going to be positioned within the disc. So when we go to engine build, they're, they're located and selected in those exact locations. This is the attention to detail that ensures every Trent engine is as safe and efficient as it can be. And with up to 150 blades leaving the factory every week, it's also the challenge that keeps Mike going. For me, it's exciting. After 27 years working on fan blade, it's still exciting. There's still a lot more to do. Rolls-Royce is a global company. Some parts of the engine are made and assembled at factories abroad. Getting them to the UK is Kath Taylor's job. This is the um, turbines purchasing department um, where we source parts from all over the world and my role in particular is to uh, source the modules from mainland Europe. We're talking probably at the moment about 10 modules a week. Very occasionally we're affected by the weather um, or the ferries but the bulk of the modules do arrive on time. It may be a global company, but the biggest single module is manufactured at another of Rolls-Royce's specialist factories just 50 miles down the M1. Mark Reed is in charge of building the massive protective case that shields every engine's fan blades. primary function is to guide the air through to the main core of the engine and to provide a containment system in the event of a blade off. When the forge is originally constructed it weighs five metric tons in weight and then when it's finally uh, finished machined it's, it weighs roughly 500 kilos so we have to take uh, a large amount of material off and we have to machine it down to some very fine tolerances. Typical wall thicknesses can be around two and a half millimetres. There's a number of different processes that take place. Typically around 40, a component can spend up to 90 hours in the machine. So we put it on at the beginning of the week and we take it off at the end. 
and nothing goes to waste. Every sliver of precious material is collected and recycled to make more components. Mark runs a team of 140 top engineers, including experts in the most essential skills, turning and welding metal. One of the most experienced is welder Bob Blackwell. His job is to fix in place a ring of titanium blades that'll channel air smoothly into the engine. It's a highly specialized form of welding. I'm a TIG welder, cum sheet metal worker. I've been doing this job for 22 years now. All these veins are different, with different cameras to achieve the best airflow. Every weld on this job will be x-rayed in the x-ray, so any defects have to be taken out, obviously repaired then and put right. When this weld's finished, this, this vein should leave a tolerance of no more five mil radially and one mil forward and rearward on the blade. It's not machine, it's hand skill, and we think that's, that's, that's a fine tolerance to achieve on a hand weld. Bob works at the factory alongside his son, Lee. These are sheet metal workers, they're just the same as myself. So when roles were recruited, I asked me if we fancied joining the company. I see my dad made a good living out of it, so I decided to get a trade and just get the same trade really. These are better welder than I am, better craftsmen than I am. They don't need that. They don't need my voice. He's quite capable on his own. For this family partnership, the factory life certainly seems to promise a good future. Yeah, I hope so, yeah, yeah. At the heart of every engine is a ring of 96 turbine blades that are the most amazing components in the whole engine. Jet engines work by sucking air into the core and through multiple compressors. Squashed to a 50th of its volume, this air is forced into a combustion chamber where it explodes with fuel to create a ferocious gas jet. This jet is met head on by the turbine blades, spinning them so fast that each blade delivers the same horsepower as a Formula One engine. The job these tiny blades have to do is unbelievably demanding. The blade exists in a fairly harsh environment. It has to rotate at about 10,000 revolutions per minute, the blade speed of about 800 miles per hour. The, the component itself operates at something like 300 degrees above the melting point of the alloy. To operate at around 1,700 degrees, they're designed not to melt. Here you see the gas streams moving around the airfoil. At the bottom of the blade is the fir tree area, which is used to hold the blade into the disc. Um, above it, you see the airfoils with a peppering of cooling holes. To stop the blade melting, Rolls-Royce designers used computer modeling to design a blade that has a precise pattern of tiny air passages throughout. Here we see what the blade would look like if we didn't have it cooled. And you can see that there are some areas of red, which means that the component is too hot. We put a cooling system inside of the blade, which cools it down to safe levels. And that cooling system takes away the same amount of energy that would boil a kettle in a 20th of a second. But even with the cooling holes, no ordinary metal would be good enough. That's where the company's materials research laboratory comes in creating new metals with exactly the physical and chemical qualities demanded by the designers. To try and achieve the, the properties that the designers want, we will design some trial compositions of alloys with different recipes, um, different blends of the alloy and constituents, and then we will test those samples and different mechanical and environmental tests, and from that we'll choose the best possible blends which will deliver exactly the balance of properties that they require. Using electron microscopes, the materials scientists can precisely analyze the microstructure of the alloy, 
checking that the crystal structure and mixture of metals is exactly as intended. We've got a team of research specialists, about 25 in the team here in the UK, and there are teams in Germany and the States as well. And we're trying to draw on all the expertise that exists in the academic network around the world to bring all the best expertise we can into Rolls-Royce. Even the finely balanced alloy recipe isn't the most advanced technology in the turbine blade. To cast the metal into its complex shape, a unique process is used, and it's another very closely guarded secret. It's done at a purpose-built foundry in Derby, where one of the few people who knows the secret is casting engineer Owen Draper. If you take a normal piece of metal and solidify it from being molten, you'd end up with something that looks a bit like a granite worktop. Lots and lots of little different crystals, all in different directions. That's not very strong because the different crystals, the joints and the boundaries between them, they just cause a weakness. So what we aim to do here is to create a single crystal. Single crystal, no crystal boundaries, therefore it's an awful lot stronger. The blade is made by growing a single crystal of metal into the correct shape. It's incredibly complex and demands a huge team of people working round the clock. But it starts with an intricate, hand-built model of the blade in skilled hands like Maureen Hankies. I've been doing it on and off since 73. Skill is, you've got to be very dexterous, everything's got to be perfect, everything's got to be smooth. The secret part is the way the molten metal is cooled through a spiral tube at the base of the mould. The tube prevents all but one crystal of solid metal from passing through, allowing that single crystal to grow throughout the mould. Imperfections could ruin the casting at any stage. Even the wax models are x-rayed by keen-eyed inspectors like Jackie Brown. When we're looking for defects in the core, i.e. cracks, chips, voids, when it's sentenced to scrap is broken in half and put into the bin. Once cast, every single blade is thoroughly checked and checked again by eye, by computer, and by X-ray. Even then, they're far from ready. Each blade goes through another four days of precision finishing in the hands of machinists like Steve Ball. We're all very good at what, what we make. We don't sometimes share it. It's not until you see Trent Fleet fly over. Ah, I've made my own good bit of that. And because of the extraordinary demands on the blade, its dimensions must be accurate to within a tenth of a hair's width. We grind the fir tree to within seven microns, which is a hell of a tight limit. Goes under a load of 18 tons, that does. If we stretched it with 18 tons, regauged it, there would be nothing. Everything would be to the mic on the same. There's no alterations in the structure. There's no cracking. There's no stretching of anything on there. And bearing in mind, you've got 96 of those in an engine set. Every one is like the first one. It's perfect. It's like a brand new baby. You treat it like that. That's why the focus of everybody in the shop's the same, whether it's Six in the morning, six at night, 12 at night. Everybody's the same. The next one's always the most important because all the rest are good. Because we've never had one come back. You can't, you can't argue with that. It's the skills of people like Steve and the cutting edge technology that keeps Trent engines ahead of the game. But innovation is a risky business. Designing the Trent engine almost brought Rolls Royce to its knees. 